Hi, everybody. I wanted to talk a little bit today about fecal transplants. So I did a little research and I found this article. And I'm assuming that this is typical of what you will read if you go looking for information on fecal transplant because unfortunately, everybody is on board this particular new procedure. Um, the holistic community embraces it, loves it, and because it feeds their, um, their narrative about managing the microbiome and it allows them to sell products that are meant to do that. So this article that I found is in Dogs Naturally magazine. It was written by a vet uh, named Odette Souter, who interestingly is not using her um, her credential, her doctor status in the byline here. I don't know why, um, but she's going to take us through the an explanation of what is involved in fecal transplants. And first of all, she explains that fecal transplant is the colloquial term. The medical term is microbiome restorative therapy, MBRT for short. Um, and then she goes on to explain what the microbiome is and that it's just the landscape that the microbes inhabit and all, including the population of the microbes. She lists the various microbes that are um, included in the microbiome. And she has a mistake here because viruses are not microbes. They are not living. They're never living. They are only living when they are part of a cell. Um, they don't invade cells. They have no capacity for life on their own. They are always dead. The rest of these things, bacteria, bacteriophages, protozoa, and fungi are all microbes. And they live on every body surface that connects to the outside world. And that's because they live on every surface. They live everywhere. They are absolutely ubiquitous. She says that these microbes are generally non-pathogenic, and that's true because all microbes are non-pathogenic. There is no such thing as good bacteria and bad bacteria. They all have a role to play in the body. And when we find them at the site of disease, they are never there causing it. They are there helping to clean it up. So she goes on to talk about the the number of microbes we have in our bodies. And um, she says, every microbiome is unique. Of course, it's like a fingerprint. It's like a snowflake. They're all different. Um, what causes disease? At the end of this, this section, she says, what causes disease? Should we treat the cells and focus on their dysfunction? Or should we aim to improve the health and diversity of our microbes? I would say there's a third question. Um, shouldn't we just feed the body properly and allow it to manage the health and diversity of the microbes that it deems um, suitable to inhabit the internal um, regions of the body? Um, and she says that she believes the future of medicine is in treating the microbiome. That might be true, but um, we have no need of medicine if we understand causes and we want to remove causes. And if we remove causes, we have no need to treat anything, including the microbiome. So um, what disrupts the microbiome? Um, yes, all of these things kill microbes in the body. Um, they also kill um, lots of other things. They kill healthy living cells and um, they do other damage to tissues and cells. Um, and it's, this article says 95% of microbes live in the gut and we can trace about 90% of diseases to the gut in an unhealthy gut biome. Well, I would say that we can trace 99% of diseases even farther back than that because we have to look at what created the unhealthy gut biome. And the biome didn't get that way all by itself. It's there as a response to what it is fed. Um, 
the author says unhealthy gut leads to disease. It doesn't lead to disease. It's part of disease. It's not a cause. It's a consequence. It's every bit as much a consequence as anything that she has listed here in her list of diseases that she says stem from a dysfunctional gastrointestinal tract. The gastrointestinal tract does not become dysfunctional on its own. It becomes dysfunctional as a consequence of being misfed. And that's where our power is. And whether this person realizes it or not, she's taking away our power. So next, um, she tells us where microbes come from. She says, as disgusting as it sounds, eating shit, quote unquote, promotes a healthy life. Animals seem to know this instinctively. And here she's going to give us some examples that um, she hopes, I think, will support that contention. And the first one is Daisy, a poodle that she apparently used to know, that would eat some horse, horse manure piles and would um, pay no attention to others. Um, but this is a misfed dog, and we can't really glean anything of use from the behavior of a misfed dog. Misfed dogs will eat everything under the sun, and they are um, not discerning based on whether there's any real food value in what they're eating, but um, by other things, by just... Um, a lack of um, innate um, intelligence. Um, their domestic dogs are just, they're not reflective always of what would happen in nature. And it's the same with horses. She goes on to explain that foals will often eat their mother's feces, but here she's talking about pasture raised horses, and those would be. Um, improperly fed, those would be fed hay. I don't know a whole lot about horses, but I know they're supposed to eat grass, but if they're pasture raised, um, they can't eat grass because they eat it faster than the grass will grow. In the wild, dogs and cats first feast on the intestines of their prey. This provides large amounts of microorganisms. Um, I don't think that's true. Um, we've seen the research on wolves show that when they kill an ungulate, they shake the contents of the stomach loose before eating the actual tissue of the stomach. And I've done my own experiments with feeding various parts of wild prey to my own animals. And I actually have tried feeding them the intestines of a wild rabbit, a rabbit that was eating only what it's supposed to eat. Um, they would eat just about every part of it except the feces that were contained and the pre-digested food that was contained in the intestines. They wanted no part of that, but they did eat the tissue itself. Um, I don't think dogs and cats and animals in general go around trying to get microorganisms into their bodies um, because if they did that, they would be more, um, they would find rotting meat more appealing, and they generally don't. Dogs prefer fresh meat, although they will eat um, rotting um, meat if they must, if they're hungry when they find it. Um, cats are pretty discerning in that area. They tend to like only um, fresh meat. But she says um, dogs also enjoy a buffet of rotting carcasses to increase their intake of microbes. Well, they might, um, as incidentally, um, cash their food when they can't eat anymore and go back for it later, in which case it would be uh, presumably rotting. Um, and they might come across um, carcasses of animals that were killed by other um, predators and partake of them, but they wouldn't do that intentionally. They would not forego fresh food in favor of rotting food. Next, she takes us through what the microbiome does. And this is, uh, this is a bunch of minutia and reductionism that we don't really need to know anything about because it's all about um, presumably, or the presumption that we can manage our microbiome. 
And as I said in my previous videos, we can no more manage our microbiome than we can manage our neighbor's budget or their household. Um, it's, it's not our affair to go managing our microbiome. That is the body's domain. We need manage only what goes in our mouths. And in the case of our dogs, only what goes in our dog's mouth. So the next section, she's going to um, give support to the idea of fecal transplants by saying that it's not new and it's actually a very old treatment. Um, it's been around since the fourth century. And unfortunately, people love to give credence to things that have been done for a long time, for thousands of years. They tend to revere um, traditional Chinese medicine and other forms of um, oriental medicine that um, are very old, um, but what they don't realize is that medicine was always developed in response to disease, and the disease was there before medicine, and that means mistakes were being made that caused the disease, because the disease is always related to food. When humans started making mistakes with what they were eating, they, um, they encountered disease. And medicine was the, the response to the disease. So it's, um, it, it doesn't do any, it doesn't lend any support for um, uh, a treatment or an idea to say that it's very old, unless you go way back before modern civilization when humans were doing things correctly. Um, and next, she's going to talk about the transplant recipient and what they do to prepare the recipient for the uh, procedure. And this is important because they say that they, um, they test for food sensitivities and food, this, these tests generally get foods out of the diet that shouldn't have been there in the first place. Um, some of those, some of these food sensitivities might arise from seemingly um, normal, biologically appropriate fruit, food like chicken, but it's not the chicken itself that's causing the problem. What people don't seem to realize is that chicken is very fatty the way it is fed in the raw diet. And if you just got rid of the fat, instead of getting rid of the entire chicken, then you would have the same result, the same positive result as getting rid of chicken completely. So people will get rid of chicken and they will see improvements, especially if they replace it with um, these so-called novel proteins, which tend to be much leaner. And they will assume that it was the chicken and it wasn't, it was the fat. So that's one thing that's happening in food sensitivities. Other in, this, in these tests, other um, foods that aren't appropriate um, will be eliminated during that process too. So um, they eliminate the so-called pro-inflammatory foods. Um, they don't feed processed foods with poor quality ingredients. So in advance of the procedure, they're going to improve the diet. So they're improving the diet. And in addition to that, they're going to be adding probiotics, digestive enzymes, and immune support product. I don't know what immune support product is. I wouldn't give it to a dog. I, um, the only thing that in that list that has any validity in my mind is digestive enzymes. And that's because they actually do help break down the food when the dog doesn't produce sufficient enzymes on his own. So um, the enzymes along with the improvement, improvements to the food could very easily account for the improvements that are seen in dogs that are um, that um, experience improvements after this procedure. So they, she talks about finding a donor dog, and I don't think there's really anything in there worth um, commenting about. They do like to use the feces of a quote unquote healthy dog because they once again assume that a, uh, an unhealthy dog will have pathogens in their poop, that they will be overrun with pathogens and that these would consequently overrun the new recipient, um, which is not the case. So that's another mistake that they're making, another assumption. 
that they're not, they're just not standing back and looking objectively at. Um, and she lists the various kinds of um, diseases that can be helped by this procedure. And it's pretty long. It's probably just about everything. She does include a video of herself um, giving a fecal transplant to a dog, which is interesting to watch if you're interested. Um, and she gives two case histories, aren't really case histories. They're just um, a few paragraphs of um, a couple examples of dogs that she had given this treatment to. Um, one was a German Shepherd with um, IBD, who was a police dog, but couldn't continue because of his health issues and high anxiety. Um, the owners had um, gone, put the dog through a battery of tests and treatments. He'd had food sensitivity and switched to a raw diet. And despite all these efforts, his gut health was still suffering. Well, th what that means is they didn't uncover the cause. If the dog was still suffering after months and months of a raw diet, then there was something in the raw diet that was continuing the, the problem. And IBD is something that generally clears up pretty quickly. When we're talking about something like long-standing allergies, skin issues, those can take many months and sometimes years to completely clear up. Not so with IBD. That's uh, the, um, the intestinal tract actually heals pretty quickly when its burdens are lifted. So um, what she says in this little blurb about bear here, the German Shepherd, is that this uh, procedure was a success. Um, the owner sent her an email saying, bear's poop is formed and soft color is improvement. All he wants to do is play. His energy level is off the charts. So, um, but the problem with assuming that all of these improvements are a consequence of the, the treatment, the fecal transplant, is that that's not all they did. And the only way that you can attribute improvements to a procedure is if that's all you do. If there's a whole bunch of things that you do, then it could easily be the other things that are responsible for the improvements. So she talks about a second, um, uh, a second dog here, a lab, who had suffered from skin allergies and recurring ear infections. Well, we know what causes those. What causes those are um, generally too much fat in the diet, misfeeding overall. Um, the, the owners had already put him on a raw diet. They had tried many therapies. So what they did there is they put the dog on a raw diet and it didn't solve the problem. But the problem with assuming that you've done everything right up to that point is that you're, um, you're believing the idea that a raw diet, no matter how it's put together, is optimal, that it's sufficient to, um, to reverse disease. And it's not in many, many cases. Um, the owners needed to realize that a raw diet isn't enough. It needs to be looked at. It needs to be optimal. It needs to be low in fat. Um, fat is a big deal. Fat's what, coming, fat's what is coming through the ears when dogs have stuff constantly coming out their ears. It's mostly fat. There's no point during the um, evolution of dogs when they had the opportunity to eat extremely fatty animals like those that are raised in, in animal agriculture. And even if you buy the best, the absolute best um, agricultural animals to feed your dog, they are still fattened for slaughter. Well, nature doesn't fatten anything for market, um, especially prey animals. Prey animals are typically extremely lean. So um, anyway, when they discovered that the raw diet didn't solve the problems, then they went to therapies and the skin was out of control and Hudson's, the dog's quality of life was seriously compromised. And from that point, they went to medications just to keep him comfortable. Um, and then they did the usual protocol, which was to um, test for food sensitivities, eliminate the foods he was sensitive to, and otherwise preparing the gut um, for the fecal transplant. So she says in the last 
sentence here, since the transplant, he's completely changed in appearance. He's regained his joy for life and mischief. A repeat transplant quickly, quickly revolved a brief flare up this spring. So as she's writing this, it's obviously in the same year. And so just a few months ago, apparently, um, the dog had a flare up, um, which means this fecal transplant is not a permanent solution and it might be needed over and over. And that's a good thing for this vet because that's repeat business for her. And that's why we can't depend on vets to give us objective information about these things because what we as health educators, dog health educators need to do is we need to be telling people how to resolve these problems like skin allergies and recurring ear infections permanently, not just until they need another fecal transplant. And we can do that. And, and dog owners can do that without intervention. They can do that without expert help if they just get the right information. So that's what we're attempting to do in um, with rotational monofeeding, RMF for short. So that's the end of the article. If you want more information about rotational monofeeding, which seeks to uncover real underlying causes and empower people to um, fix their dog's health problems without intervention, um, please see the links below. Um, the website is rotationalmonofeeding.com. And please be watching for future videos. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of those. And I will see you next time. Thank you for watching.